Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. So my name is Arnaud Ors. I'm part of the Open Technology Group at IBM. I've been involved in open source and open standards pretty much my whole career. I brag about the fact that in 1990, I did my first release of something which back then we didn't even call open source. But the funny thing is I actually recently discovered it's actually still being used. It's running on my HP printer at home. <laughs> So, you know, the power of open source is there. So anyway, today we want to talk about the Supply Chain Integrity Working Group at OpenSSF. I've been involved personally in OpenSSF for the last two years. And so I just have a couple of slides I'm going to show you to give you a little bit of context. And then we will have a discussion with my co-panelists here today to try to give you a better idea of some of the names that are floating around, uh, around OpenSSF. So it should be well known to everybody, I'm sure now, that you know, open source software in general, but through open source in particular, is under attack today. We are seeing an explosion in attacks. Basically, you know, bad actors have discovered that as we harden production systems, there was a soft spot, which was the software supply chain that incorporated a lot of open source, a lot of which is not very well secured. So this is a problem that has become so important that governments around the world has actually uh, taken note and are actually starting developing, as we heard earlier in the keynotes, different regulations around the world to basically tell the industry, wait a minute, we cannot keep going like this you need to fix this problem. And so OpenSSF is part of the movement from the industry to try to address this problem. Of course, you know, it's a bigger problem than any single organization can address. So OpenSSF is by no means the only organization out there working in this space. There is quite a bit of overlap in some cases. We're trying to collaborate with other organizations, even within the Linux Foundation, right? There are different uh, foundations working on these aspects. And so um, the OpenSSF was actually launched over two years ago. Initially, we were during the COVID era. Quite frankly, organizations like IBM and other vendors were not too sure about what the economic impact was going to be, and they were not so eager in investing in a new foundation. And so the project was started in a fairly you know, atypical way with regard to how typically Linux Foundation starts projects in the sense that there was basically no funding associated with this. And so for the first year, it kind of grew organically. And I think we actually feel some of the pain because of that still today, because the organization can grow in a different ways in different parts of the organization, fairly disorganized. And, but after a year, we were getting out of COVID and people realized, okay, maybe this is not the end of the world, thankfully. We can actually take this problem more seriously and put money behind it. And there was a, in sort, a sort of reboot of the organization in 2022, where we moved to a more well-funded uh, organization with, you know, organization actually putting real money behind it. And so uh, we now have uh, these funds available. We have a fully staffed organization from the LF uh, staff. And the members have been busy. Some of us are involved in the, in the governance structure of the, uh, uh, of the organization, trying to get it all sorted out and make sense of, of uh, all the activities that are going on. So this is a high level view of the organization. I'm not going into the detail of this. This is not the point of this presentation. It's just to give you an idea. At a high level, we have a governing board, and then we have the technical advisory council that kind of oversees all the technical activities in the, in the organization. And what we're going to talk about mostly today is what's in that black uh, square or rectangle there, supply chain integrity working group, right? So we have different working groups addressing different parts of the problem. And we have one that's specifically focusing on the supply chain integrity problem. And within this, each group, right, actually has a whole bunch of different activities within them. 
they take different forms, and we are still trying to figure out all the details of the governance aspect. But at a high level, we have different types of technical initiatives. There are projects that are mostly focused on developing code, like actual programs that you can use. And then there are, uh, there are activities that are more like, you know, working on specifications or best practices, documents, guidance, that kind of stuff. So again, what we're going to focus on today is what's the, at the top uh, right corner there, the supply chain integrity. We have different uh, activities within that working group. So we have Salsa, which we'll talk quite a bit about today. There's actually two different uh, groups within related to Salsa. There's one that works on the specification. Salsa is a specification. And then there is one that actually focuses on projects. So there are tools being developed that actually help you uh, use and implement Salsa. And then we have Fresca is uh, one of the implementations of Salsa, which we'll talk about. And there is S2C2F is another specification. And then there is another, um, there's a group, which is the Integrity Positioning Working Group. This is a bit different of SIG. It's, it's, it tries to give a little bit more of a positioning of all the different pieces, how they relate to one another within OpenSSF and beyond, and try to you know, identify possi possible gaps so that we can put that on a roadmap moving forward. And then there is a newcomer. We, it's not officially part of OpenSSF today, but you know, I'm hoping maybe it will become. And there has been, you know, there's been a proposal, so it's not completely accidental. I'm bringing this up. <laughs> it's called GUAC, and I think you know whether it, it ends up in OpenSSF or not. I think it's a tool that's related to the supply chain integrity, and uh, I think it's worth mentioning. And we have one of the co-panelists involved in this, so he can tell us more about this. So that sets the background. This is what I wanted to kind of give you as a, as a background for the discussion today. So now I would like to turn to the panelists and let them introduce themselves first. So, sure. Mike. Um, I'm Mike Lieberman. I am a uh, co-founder of the software supply chain security company, Kusari. Um, I'm also an author of the book, um, Securing the Software Supply Chain by Manning Public, uh, Publications. Um, on the, in the open source space, uh, I'm a CNCF tag security lead. Uh, I'm also uh, an OpenSSF um, uh, TAC member. Um, I'm also a uh, steering committee member, and I'm also a, the co-creator of the Guac project. Laura? I'm Laura C. I work at Red Hat. I'm a um, manager of our supply chain operations team um, under product security, and uh, I uh, participate in the positioning group for so, um, supply chain integrity. My name is Joshua Locke. I am a steering committee member on the Salsa project and uh, try to get involved in a bunch of the OpenSSF efforts and um, paid to work at Verizon in their new open source program office. We're just kind of bootstrapping that. Uh, Jay White, I work in the open source strategy ecosystem team at Microsoft. Um, I'm all over the damn place. <laughs> um, I, and I, I'm being all over the place in Microsoft, all over the place in the open SSF and in other open source communities as well. I'm a board member, uh, a board member on Oasis Open. Um, I work in the uh, supply chain integrity working group as a co-lead. I'm a co-lead of the positioning uh, SIG, co-lead in the S2C2F SIG, uh, co-lead in the DEI education uh, subcommittee. Um, am I forgetting it? I, I, <laughs> I think it's any, good any, stuff. anyway. I'm all over the place. I love this stuff. <laughs> all right. um, so, so that, that's why I'm all over the place. I don't sleep much. Okay, good. If Jay lists all the group he participates in, it will run, run out of time before the end. So, <laughs> I, every time I join a, an open SSF call, Jay is on it, <laughs> no matter what it is about. So. Thank you. So, I mean, the goal, you know, is primarily going through all these different technologies so that this alphabet soup kind of thing makes more sense at the end, right? So we're going to go through a few rounds of questions and then, of course, we'll open to the public if you have questions as well. So let's get started with Salsa. Laura, can you tell us briefly at a high level what Salsa is about? 
Yeah, sure. So SALSA stands for um, Supply Chain Levels uh, for Software Artifacts. And it's a, a set of guidelines for securing your software supply chain. Um, it is uh, established by industry consensus to prevent um, tampering, um, to improve build integrity, and secure software packages and infrastructure. Um, it's um, also uh, organized by tracks and levels. So there are tracks that um, are uh, focused on a specific aspect of the supply chain. Um, right now we have just the build track, so it makes it easy to keep track of. Um, and then the uh, levels, so it's measured by security levels for incremental adoption. Um, and uh, the build track has uh, three levels right now. So uh, one, one, two, and three. Thank you. Uh, Michael Fresca. Sure. Um, so Fresca is a implementation of the CNCF's um, secure software factory reference architecture. Um, it, uses, it utilizes a bunch of different open source tools like Tekton, Tekton Chains, Spiffy Spire, uh, the Q language, if anybody's familiar with that, um, uh, along with some other tools to try and create something that really implements Salsa and looks at like what can even kind of go beyond uh, when it comes to sort of securing the build and uh, securing the uh, supply chain. And Jay, I'll turn to you for S2C2F. Uh, S2C2F, uh, uh, Secure Supply Chain Consumption Framework. Um, eight practices, four maturity levels, uh, takes you all the way through ingesting uh, open source to how you protect it, preventing, uh, if you can, prevent uh, tax. Uh, all the way to auditing now, how do you audit the nature of your uh, protection methods into fixing things and then upstreaming, right? Um, really designed for the consumer in mind, so how individuals ingest and consume open source software, and then uh, pairs very nicely with, with the other frameworks as it takes from one end, takes you into the middle, and then allows connective tissues on into the others. All right, thank you. And so let's finish with Guac. Sure, so GWAC uh, is a, a tool, a, a backronym for Graph for Understanding Artifact Composition because Salsa and GWAC. Um, so uh, it's intended to be sort of, um, you know, an ingester for all of your software supply chain metadata, whether it's SBOMs, whether it's information from uh, sites like OSV or Depths.dev, um, scorecards, and tries to aggregate it all into a graph. Um, that can then be used uh, so that, you know, from the consumption side, you can kind of say, am I uh, enforcing the best practices um, and those sorts of things. So you can ask questions like, you know, am I enforcing this S2C2F requirement? Um, do I have a salsa attestation for this project? That sort of thing. All right. So let's now get a little bit deeper into what's behind those, you know, high level introductions. So, I mean, uh, Joshua, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about Salsa. Who is it for? What is it for? Um, so Salsa is really focused on kind of improving um, the machinery that we use to build and uh, deliver software. So um, the kind of the end users, the developers, uh, shouldn't have to do too much work in order to adopt Salsa in, an, in the ideal circumstance. The build track especially is very much focused on people building CI and CD systems, um, and uh, the next things we're going to work on is chaining more of those platforms um, together to improve the integrity. Um, so the, one of the core principles of Salsa is uh, trusting platforms, not individuals, so we can um, identify a system that we trust and um, root trust in that rather than trying to evaluate whether we can trust all of the individuals producing software in the spot chain. So Laura, does that, I mean, how does that relate to compliance? I mean, we heard, you know, earlier, there's more and more references to regulations and compliance, which plays a, an increasing role. What's, does Salsa play any, uh, how does the Salsa fit within the compliance uh, picture? Sure, yeah, it provides evidence for attestations and it also strongly aligns to um, NIST's secure software development framework. It also um, aligns to NIST 800-53 uh, for security and privacy, also um, 800-161 specifically written for supply chain 
and um, even uh, OWASP, um, and we did a mapping to OWASP for uh, SAM version 2.0, which stands for Software Assurance Maturity Model. Um, and so, yeah, if you are, are um, trying to uh, attest to any of those um, industry frameworks or governmental frameworks, it's um, a step in the right direction. And it's great because uh, with the SALSA specification group, um, it demystifies um, like how to implement um, that for, for the build requirements. All right, thank you. So Jay, I know compliance is also something that you hold close to your heart. <laughs> First, let's go back to S2C2F. Who should use it? And the big question that people always have is, so how does S2C2F compare to Salsa? Um, so S2C2F is for the end user, right? For the end user, for the consumer, uh, specifically designed to manage dependencies, right? Um, where this uh, differs and then aligns with uh, Salsa. Salsa is a more producer-focused um, framework, so it concentrates on builds in general, where uh, S2C2F controls how you manage the dependencies that go into that build, right? So this is where you'll see a lot of uh, SBOM creation. This is where you'll see ties into other things that we're working on, um, like, like VEX and, and things of that nature, right? These are the tie-ins with uh, not just stuff that we're working on inside the OpenNest stuff, but these tentacles that reach out to other organizations as well, right? Um, so end user in mind, consumption in mind, dependency management in mind, and then uh, aligns with Salsa, where when you take on these things like SBOMs and, and VEX statements, and now you're branching over into Salsa with builds and how these builds get produced, and then they go out and these create these software that our, our um, shared customers consume, now the one-two punch gives off that assurance that, hey, and I, know I said the word assurance, right? Gives off that assurance that, hey, things were done securely from front all the way uh, to back. And the compliance aspect, do you have more to say? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Laura did a good job of um, providing the mapping between uh, SALSA and S the SSDF and, and OWASP and 800-53. Well, um, S2C2F does the same thing, right? Um, there are mappings that go back and forth. So if you take the controls in S2C2F and then right down there in the bottom of it, you'll see the mappings and the mappings are, are, are very similar, right? So you are able to make, meet certain compliance requirements, but even more so, right? So here um, in, 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 in Europe and in, in, in the States, um, also uh, South America, Australia, there are all these different um, uh, privacy requirements that are being developed, security requirements that are being developed, but even more so, the cybersecurity requirements around how software gets developed, how it gets consumed, and when they say consumed, we mean by the person buying the software, and whether or not they're secure, the, the, the security is in place enough for them to use it, and, and therefore not, not to be uh, data disclosures and everything else, right? All this stuff is happening. What these frameworks attempt to do, because we're working so closely with them, we're so close to these different, um, these different regulations that are being developed, is that we get a chance to say, hey, how can we meet the metric and it's at the same time uh, not reduce productivity? So when it comes to compliance, right, I, I always refer to this, to this meme with the truck that got these big giant wheels, but they forgot to change the damn tire in the back of the truck that has the original factory wheel on it, and all the thing says is you gotta have that, that wheel on it, right? That wheel has to be there for the truck to be compliant. And nothing says that the wheel can fit on the little big wheels that you now put on it, right? So, so when it comes to compliance, I say, all right, let's meet the metric, but also let's make sure things are secure. What we have to be careful of is to not over-engineer uh, in the process. So. That's how, I, that's how I feel about compliance. You could meet the compliance requirements, but let's make sure that we're still you know, keeping our thumb on, on uh, security controls, et cetera. All right, thank you. So let's talk about the status of those different technologies. So Laura, what's, Salsa actually hit a major milestone in the spring. Can you tell us more about the status of Salsa? So yes, Salsa uh, released its um, um, first 
version, so version 1.0 in April, and it specifically focuses on um, the build requirements and specifically for producers and build platforms. So the build, um, the build platform requirements um, are um, include provenance generation and isolation strength. Um, for provenance generation, it uh, like level, starts with level one, um, it just must exist, right? And then uh, level two would be um, to authenticate, it must be authentic. And the third one would be um, that you, ha it has, you have to be able to deliver the provenance. And so, uh, when with regard to the isolation strength, or I'm sorry, unforgeable, unforgeable, I believe is the word is is used for, for build level three, um, and then for isolation strength, it um, level two, it must be hosted, and then uh, level three, it must be isolated. So that's, um, a, but with all that, there's also an attestation model that go, goes along with it, so that you can. Um, uh, sort of like a analogy with the manufacturing factory. So um, the first step would be to have that tamper proof seal um, for the code. And the second would be to verify that the artifacts uh, were created by who they said they, it was created by with its stamp uh, made by Harry in Michigan. Um, and then the third would be to just implement um, industry best practices. All right, thank you. Sure. I will interject that there's something that has confused people a little bit, which I think is worth explaining about Salsa, because it's kind of like we have three dimensions at play. We have the version of the specification. So in this case, we're at Salsa 1.0. We have different levels and different tracks. And it becomes a bit like, you know, a puzzle to put all the pieces together. So I think you need to understand that those things are actually uh, uh, unrelated in some ways. The idea was, you know, well, we have the version of the specification and it surprised a lot of people that the one zero has less than what Salsa zero, I think five was the previous version two, zero point two. Okay, zero point two. Uh, and so this was actually, you know, a, a concerted, you know, decision in the group to say, okay, we cannot focus on trying to address all the issues we have with the original draft, which, you know, we have to give them credit. It came initially from Google. So they came with a specification that contributed to OpenSSF. And as it always happens, I am an old standards guy. And, you know, every time you bring your spec, you think, oh, this is solid. Well, as soon as you submit it to public scrutiny, you realize there's plenty of holes you had not even thought about. And so it happened there as well. So a lot of issues came up and then the group said, well, if we try to address all these issues, we'll never be done anytime soon. And so there was people already implementing the Salsa 0.2 draft that was out there. And so the group decided to basically narrow down the scope. So we went from four levels to three and we reduced the number. We came up with this notion of tracks to define different domains, if you will, and focus on the build track for the one zero. And some people were offended a little bit, I say, <laughs> you know, because they say, wait, you know, we, 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 you, you, you basically, you know, we, we cut short of the, the, the original offering because we remove stuff. And some people said, how can you even dare calling that a one zero? You should maybe call it a 0 0.5 or something like this. But so this was, you know, concerted effort within the group. Everybody agreed this is the most rational way of progressing and getting something out there that the industry can start using sooner rather than later. Yeah, so the one zero was really an, um, an indicator of confidence and stability, not of features. Um, yep. And so we effectively, in software terms, removed features uh, from 0 0.2 to 1.0. But that's because uh, the focus was always... So one of the things that I think is super interesting about what's happening in the SEI working group is that it's basically taking best practices that companies and communities have developed over years and trying to enshrine those in standards that people can implement uh, in, in, incremental, in incremental ways and as easily as possible. And so what we found with Salsa Level 4 and some of the non-build requirements, or Build Level 4 and some of the non-build requirements, is that we we're struggling to articulate those in a way that everyone could understand and that would be 
equally as applicable to like Google and Microsoft scale organizations as to, you know, three person open source projects. And so that's why we uh, ended up removing those things ultimately. Um, well, we continue to work on reintroducing those features, but with those kind of goals in mind of being um, very clear and uh, relatively easy. You know, none of this is easy to implement, but at least clear to implement um, and well, well described. So why don't you continue on this actually trend and, and tell us what's happening now with regard to Salsa. I mean, as we talked about, Laura said, Salsa 1.0 came out in April. And quite frankly, after that seems like nothing has happening. I was involved in the group and I think honestly, everybody needed to take a break a little bit and focus on other things because we worked really hard to get that 1.0 out. But work is starting again. So can you tell us what's happening? Yeah, so we did take a break. Some of us changed employer, um, but we have resumed effort. We, we've got a few things happening. So we're trying to release an incremental patch version. So we're following semantic versioning so that we can indicate um, when we're making changes which are incompatible. We're trying to make sure that we signal very heavily when people should be paying more attention to changes in the specification. We've been making some editorial uh, clarity edits over time to the 1.0 release, but working towards a 1.1, which introduces further clarity, um, but based on how you interpret it, that could be considered to be uh, a significant change. So that's why we're working um, towards this patch number release, not patch number, minor version number release. Uh, but we're also working on new features that we, um, we don't have a concrete timeline for, but we're focused on um, source, which is something that was removed from the 0 0.2 version of the spec. Uh, notions of um, whether the source has been reviewed or scanned by various tools, um, how you can uh, have a greater level of assurance that the source code that you introduced into your build system um, is the source code you expected. So we have some of that encoded in uh, the build platform, the build track, but um, there's definitely a lot more we could do. So that's a very active area of discussion. Uh, and then we also want to introduce um, some, ad some additional um, considerations for the build platform. So one notion that was in Salsa 0.2 that we unfortunately lost a bit in 1.0 was this, uh, because it's, it's so abstract, we can very easily hand wavily say, two people should approve everything as a general kind of principle, but then how do you turn that into kind of something concrete for each of the different tracks? So with code review, it'd be like, you should have two, two reviewers uh, effectively for each pull request or for the build platform. Um, we like this notion of uh, you, can't make you can't make changes to the platform itself, whether that's the operating system or you know, the, the users that are enabled on it and things like that uh, without a second approver. So no one rogue agent. Um, I, I think of there's a, an XKCD comic which um, uses the, uh, the $10 wrench security um, metric. And so we're trying to uh, make sure that we don't have a, or that we have a two wrench factor effectively uh, throughout the specification. So yeah, the things we're working on, source track, uh, build platform, and then we want to reintroduce uh, level four of the build track. All right, thank you. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, so that is absolutely a concern that um, has been raised and why we have struggled. Uh, we had this notion of like, um, I forget the exact term we used, but effectively, like if you're a maintainer of a project and you open a pull request and another maintainer reviews it, that's kind of two because you're already a known trusted entity. But if you are a non-maintainer and you submit a, submit a pull request and that's reviewed by one maintainer, that, that's a weaker level of uh, review because there's uh, only one trusted known entity involved. Uh, but like, I didn't do a great job of explaining that and trying to write that in uh, like clear and precise text has been a challenge. But then also, even that is contended. We would like uh, open source projects as much as possible to be able to achieve as many salsa levels as possible. Um, so yeah, that is, is a great question. It is a topic of contention. Like, we don't have a good solution for that. Uh, it's, we, we are definitely going to have to strike a balance between security goals and um, supporting smallest projects. 
Uh, but I think ultimately there will come a cutoff where if you're a tiny project, you'll only be able to reach a certain level. Just and I, and I think that accurately reflects the kind of risks that um, people are implicitly taking on by depending on a single person project, for example. Just to have an organization dedicated to software reviewers, that any open source reviewer can reach out to and be like, I need a reviewer on the pull request, and then all of a sudden you're That would be a good way for the OpenSSF to spend all of its money very quickly. <laughs> And, and, you know, it's very easy to create new GitHub uh, account, too. Yeah. So one person can impersonate, <laughs> right? Not suggesting anything, yeah. but I mean, that there are limitations the that are well understood. So, but. I, I, but I, I don't think we have time to address the question now, obviously. This is a big question. Yeah. You know, my, my, my view on this general problem is we cannot address the whole chain of problems we are facing, right? But this is still moving us a step forward. It doesn't solve everything, but it's still better than if we had none of this. I, I, and I think it is important to, seriously to know that we, we are concerned by these kind of things, and there are people in the group that um, raise that concern. And we do joke about it, but we one of the reasons that we removed that requirement from uh, for the initial release is because we, we don't want to place arbitrary barriers towards uh, open source projects becoming secure. That's ultimately, most of us are there because that's our kind of passion, our interest. Um, we don't have a good solution. And one of my current faults is that I make jokes about things that I can't uh, solve. But yeah, there's, it's definitely a big problem that we would like to try and address, and we don't have a good solution. <laughs> yes. All right. So let's move on a little bit because I still want to hear uh, Jay give it, you know uh, give you a chance to talk about the status of S two C two F and what's happening. What are you guys doing? Um, so S two C two F is evolving all the time. As a matter of fact, we've just um, added a new control. Uh, we added uh, one a few months ago around audit, and then we added a new uh, control around. Um, uh, another another, uh, another threat that came up and it was very recent. I can't remember. Please go to the repo, look up the, the issue and the pull request is there. Trust me. Anyway, um, one of the other cool things that's happened in those is that we just had a hackathon um, internal to Microsoft, of course, and I tried as hard as I could to get external participants, but the hackathon was to develop an attestation tool um, that can provide a level of assurance of meeting at least level two on S2C2F, and of course that's through um, doing specific GitHub actions and things like that. We're still trying to perfect it. But the great thing about this tool is that it's, it's formatted in OSCAL format. Um, now, OSCAL format, I'm still working out or helping to work out. When I, by, by helping, I mean doing a whole hell of a lot of complaining, finger pointing, questions asking and waiting for answers. And then when I'll get those answers, give me the answers and I'm to, to asking people, but, but really trying to operationalize OSCAL in such a way because it's, it's uh, so dynamic um, that you're able to report out uh, in machine readable format and provide those assurances in machine readable format that says, hey, you are indeed meeting level two because it was an automated check that you had these specific things uh, enabled that provides that level of, of, of assurance. 
Anyway, that's, that's, that's happening right now. That's also very exciting. Also, um, S2C2F is, is working with GUAC um, closely as well to see if we can bridge that gap between you know, putting the art artifact stuff on the, on the end of S2C2F so now you can provide that historical context of where things were, where things are now, and of course, where things are going to be, right? In, in graphing format, right? So, and, 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 and I say that to say, once again, these tentacles, right? These tentacles, man. Um, so yeah, so that's where S2C2F is, is there. And of course, you know, we'll, we'll say this at the end, I'm gonna say it now though, come on in, the, the, the water's warm. So Michael, why don't you follow up and tell us a bit more about Guac? What's the status, what's going on there? Sure, sure. So Guac is currently sort of in uh, beta. It's had its like uh, 0.1 release uh, a few months ago, and now we're up to 0.1.2. Maybe 0.1.3 this week. I, I haven't been checking up with my emails. Um, but uh, so, you know, Guac, uh, as I sort of mentioned before, is trying to kind of come in and ingest all this data from places like, you know, Salsa, your Salsa attestations, your S bombs in all the various formats, uh, and, and lots of other supply chain metadata like OSB, devs.dev, scorecards, and associate it with the stuff like the artifacts, the identities that sign those artifacts, and those sorts of things into a giant graph that you can then query to kind of, you know, ask questions like, am I compliant or conformant to this uh, S2C2F requirement? Am I conformant to, compliant to this NIST requirement? Um, and so, yeah, Guac is, is, is very much focused on that sort of thing. So you can ask questions like, do I have log for shell somewhere in my known software supply chain, right? And also in addition to that, Guac really tries to help answer the question of, do I have enough information to be able to answer that question in the first place? Because that's like, I think one of the key things that's been missing from a lot of the software supply chain stuff is people just go and say, great, I generated an S bomb. Well, is it accurate? Is it complete? Do you know? Um, and so with stuff like Guac, we can start to see where are sort of the big gaps, you know, where, where does, you know, my supply chain supposedly end, right? You know, it, you know, I might have three or four layers of artifacts and then somewhere down here I have my final artifact but does it still have its own dependencies or do I just not know and guac is is hoping to help answer that and hope uh, is is helping answer stuff like if in the future you're like hey I have um, uh, it, some salsa attestations that came from this party we know they were compromised so now we are concerned that all of these artifacts that we might have ingested over the past X amount of months are now vulnerable find me all of those artifacts, where do they live, where do they live in my software supply chain, and then also eventually, where are they deployed, um, and, and how do I answer that, and then potentially, where are the central areas that I need to upgrade to just be able to kind of uh, um, uh, sort of uh, fix the problem, fix those vulnerabilities, upgrade, and that sort of thing. All right, thank you. Unfortunately, we're already running out of time. <laughs> so. To finish, I would like to invite everybody, you know, I recognize quite a few people here, so a lot of you already know that, but, you know, one of the particularities of uh, Linux Foundation organizations, they're open to everybody. Of course, you can be a member and support these organizations financially, but independently of that, you're welcome to participate. So I invite you to look into OpenSSF. I gave you a quick overview. If you haven't looked into it, there's certainly something, if you're in this room, there's probably something that was of interest to you. Uh, we welcome every newcomer. Typically, we have calls. There's an open, uh, there's a community calendar that's available where you see all the different calls from all the different groups uh, on the calendar. Don't be intimidated. Feel free to join. Typically, we make an effort to give every newcomer to introduce themselves at the beginning. If you're not comfortable, it's okay to just pass and stay silent. But we all were there once, first time, right? So don't let that stop you. Just, you know, attend. And as you get more comfortable and you feel like you want to contribute, you can stop participating. I do want to also point out that if you want to know more about uh, Salsa, there's actually a good opportunity. There's a tech talk that's going to happen on October 5th. It's online, it's free. 
you can uh, participate or uh, uh, attend. I put the QR code there. Uh, if you can't scan that, you can find it from the website. If you go to opensf.org and you go to the events, it's actually listed there and there is all the information on how to join that event. So I invite you to take that as an opportunity to know, you know, to, to do learn more about Salsa. Several people here will be part of that panel. And so thank you all for joining us today. We'll be around, most of us, for several more days. Feel free, if you haven't had a chance, to ask us questions here to follow up later on. Thank you.